All right, folks, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we'll get started, and as folks come rolling in, uh, they can get caught up with us. Uh, webinar today is called Strategic Leadership in Complex Conflicts. And I am your host, Dr. Mark Zabel. Uh, I am the VP Insights and Engagement here at Anspeace. And we're super excited that you could join us. A um, little bit of housekeeping for you, just while as we get started. Um, Thanks, uh, big thanks to Danielle and Rachel for setting this up and get everything organized. Um, I'll talk for about 30, 35 minutes maybe, uh, and then we'll take some uh, questions afterwards. Best way to get questions is in the menu there. It says Q&A. So you can ask questions in the Q&A. Don't use the chat uh, for this one, uh, just easier uh, afterwards if, if we could just use the Q&A. Um, and then at the end, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go through as many of your questions as possible. Uh, you can also try uh, doing the hand raise, um, but we'll go through the Q&A first. Um, and, and just so you know, afterwards, we'll follow up with an email, which will have um, one of the documents or access to one of the documents we're going to talk about, the key moment tracker, which we'll get to in a sec. Um, We'll also give you an opportunity to connect with me for a 30 minute um, consultation. Uh, and then we'll also be giving you a link to the recording of this session. So you can have that for your own use. So let's, uh, let's get rolling here so we can respect everyone's time. Picture, if you will, uh, you and the team have created a, an amazing project. It's a thing of beauty. You, you've done all your due diligence. You've worked really, really hard to make this thing incredible. And you cannot wait to unleash it on the world. Unfortunately, when you do so, this is all they see. So they don't see the beautiful garden that you've created for them. All they see is a dystopian hellscape. Um, what we need to do now is make sure that they change their perceptions and they allow you to do what you need to do. This can take the form of mega projects. It can take the form of marketing projects. There's any uh, sort of applications to this, but the key here for us is going to be situations where you've got some really strong opposition and they are not buying what you have to say. The goal here is to help you show strategic leadership in that sort of situation. And it's a nice buzzword. Here's what we mean by that it means knowing what to do when to do it, and why to do it. And when we're dealing with a really complex sort of conflict like we're gonna be talking about, this is no small thing. If you are a CEO, it's absolutely critical that you be able to lead your team through a difficult challenge. And the bigger the challenge, the bigger the role you are expected to play. Similar if you're an advisor to clients, you need to be able to help them navigate through really tricky situations like this. And also, if you're in the middle of the protest or if you're someone who's standing against the project, you also need to be able to show up and show strategic leadership in this sort of situation. Real quickly, um, here's a little bit about me. Uh, just so you know, my perspectives and biases, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So here's uh, kind of my approach to things. First of all, I'm the author of the book Fight Different, The Power of Focal Thinking in Systemic Conflicts. This is going to be the, the, the main source of the content that we're going to be talking about. Um, just so you know a little bit about me, like I said, the VP of Research and Engagement at Anstis, been in the business 25 plus years, uh, mostly in issues management, corporate communication, marketing. Uh, I've got an education, uh, lots of, I, I hoard degrees, so I've got lots of uh, background in this, and I'm also an informally been participating with the International Association of Public Participation. International Association of Business uh, Communications and the Santa Fe Institute of Complexity. Uh, my perspectives, I live to give voice to the voiceless. And so you're gonna see that permeate uh, everything that we talk about here. I also see infrastructure as a unifier. So think back to when, uh, you know, up in Canada, when we built the uh, railroad across the country, that was a tough challenge, but it was a real unifier for the country. Infrastructure can be a unifier for society if we do it right. Certainly if we do it wrong, it has the opposite effect. I'm also a fan of design thinking. 
and obviously complex systems as we'll get a look at. So hopefully that gives you a sense of where I'm coming from. Take it with a grain of salt, but it's important that you know my background and uh, uh, perceptions. So quick executive summary, we're gonna talk about four things. Conflicts are not negotiations. Individuals are everything. Focus on the power and change your organizational habits. That's gonna be the structure of what we'll talk about. So let's start off uh, initially. Conflicts are not negotiations. Anytime there's a different word for something, that's your clue, there's something that's different. So conflicts, uh, according to my favorite definition, are a relational process that's influenced by the perception of incompatible activities. So first of all, it's a relational process. This is a relationship between human beings and those relationships happen at the individual level. It's a process, so it unfolds over time. What happens today may not happen tomorrow and just because it happened yesterday doesn't mean it will ever happen again. It's an ongoing process over time it's influenced by perception. So we're not dealing with reality. We're not dealing necessarily with facts. We're dealing with perceptions. And that's absolutely critical to keep in mind. And it's also the idea of incompatible activities. I may be doing X, you may be doing Y. Our activities, X and Y, may be completely compatible, no issues there. But it's that perception of incompatibility that drives a conflict. Contrast that with negotiation. So from the Oxford Dictionary, negotiation is a formal discussion between people who are trying to reach an agreement. So you can start to see they're very different. And here's some more specifics on actually how they're different. In a conflict, it's more about people than issues. You know, when you do your, your negotiation training, they, they tell you separate the people from the issues. Well, in a conflict, the people are the issue and you ignore that as your peril. Like we talked about, perception is more important than the reality of the situation because reality is your own perspective. It's not someone else's perspective. And that perception really drives the conflict behavior at the individual level and then up into the group level. Conflicts are often more about values than they are about interests. In the negotiation, I can change my interests. If they're not mad, I can walk away but you can't really ask someone to change their values. So when you're dealing with a conflict, you need to be able to get done what you need to get done while allowing the, everyone to live their own values. Conflicts are often more about emotions uh, as opposed to rationalism. And this isn't a negative thing, it's just a fact. Uh, and conflicts are often quite emotional. It doesn't mean there's no emotions in a negotiation but it, the emotions do not drive the negotiation, the interests do, whereas in a conflict, the emotions are very much a driver for the behavior we see. Uh, and oftentimes in, in uh, a conflict, you have to get to lose-lose in order to get what you want, whereas in negotiations, you're looking usually for a win-win. So very different perspective, and it's important to keep this in mind because if you approach a conflict like a negotiation, you're gonna make it worse. Second of all, individuals are absolutely everything. When you're trying to make sense of a really complex conflict with lots of moving parts, uh, this guy was smart, Einstein, and he said, look deep into nature and then you're gonna understand everything better. So a great way to categorize some of our thinking here is to look at the difference between complicated and complex. Something is complicated like this watch movement. If there's lots of moving parts, it's really hard to understand, but once you figure it out, you've got it figured out and you know exactly what's gonna happen literally to the second. Something is complex on the other hand, if there's an element of the unknown, an element of risk, an element of uncertainty. So a better example of complex would be this murmuration of starlings. It's uh, lots of moving parts, it's very complicated, but you never know where it's gonna go next. In fact, the birds themselves don't know where they're gonna go next. This is a self-organizing system. You, there's no way to predict where it's gonna go. And what we see in the science is that a lot of complex conflicts behave very similar to this flock of birds. There is a way to model this and here's as sciencey as I get, I, I promise. So what this is, is a way to model that flock of birds. 
And what it shows you is when you change the way the individuals in the flock interact with each other, you change the whole outcome of the entire system. So I'm not going to belabor that, but these are just some parameters that you can teach each one of those individual birds in there to follow. And as you change the parameters by which they interact with each other, you change the overall system. So we'll focus just on the vision one here. And this just means uh, how, how far ahead the birds will look. So if, it's, if they're looking ahead, we've got it at set at eight here, that means they're looking eight birds deep. And so their behavior will be uh, a lot more coherent. When we drop that down, you'll see what happens. So we're just going to run this where the birds can look at each other eight birds deep. And then what you'll see is how they start interacting with each other. Now you can start to see that the flock starts to come together, starts to take some shape because they're looking pretty far ahead and they can see each other and they can react accordingly. So if we then change that parameter and say, okay, you can only look one bird deep. So you can only look at the bird, you know, in your immediate vicinity, look what happens. Nothing, there's no flock, there's no coherence at all because they're just paying attention to what's in front of them. And then as we move the slider back up and we start to say, okay, look a little bit further ahead of you, give yourself some more perspective, then the flock starts to go here. And so what this does is enable us to model that kind of behavior that we see in complex conflicts. And the takeaway here is, as you change the individual interactions, you change the entire system. You can't change the system all at once, but you can change those individual interactions. And so what guides our strategy here in a second, you'll see, is really focusing on the individuals involved not just any individuals. You really want to focus on the people that have power. And here's what we mean by that. It's important to get the difference between power and influence. Power means that person can make a material change to the conflict right now. Maybe tomorrow it'll be different, but right now they've got that power to do that. So an example might be a city council member who is uh, poised to vote on your project or a member of the regulator or uh, an MLA, a governor, a senator, a, a tribal chief, folks that, that may in a situation be able to make that conflict go away if they change their mind or make it worse if they don't. Influence are people that can only influence those in power. So a good example is uh, environmental NGOs. They usually don't have any power in a conflict, but they've got lots of influence. That's why they ally themselves with folks that do have power so that they can have some control over the outcome. You know, maybe a concerned citizen, the media, um, shippers, who are the people that are sending goods through your product, um, some indigenous bands. It depends on the situation, but it's really important to get the difference between power and influence. Because if we're in, if we're looking at a situation where we've got hundreds of potential people to um, to key in on, we want to focus on the ones that actually matter and then build from there. So here's an example. Let's say you want to build this uh, gorgeous wind farm and you've got someone on, on the council, let's call it the regulator in this case, the regulator believes that these are uh, killing birds and the noise is untenable for the local community and the transmissions lines are disruptive, et cetera, et cetera. That person is going to vote against you. You need to key in on that person and make sure that you focus your efforts on the, the, the person who is standing against you, not on all the people that are looking uh, to, to support you. More on this in a second. Here's another example. So here's a map of the coastal gas link natural gas pipeline in British Columbia. Each of those green um, uh, signs are the 20 indigenous tribes that are along that route. So uh, uh, across whose land that pipeline uh, goes. So each of those 20 groups uh, through their uh, band councils agreed that, you know what? Yeah, we need this pipeline to go. We need the money. We need the economic stimulus. The jobs are going to be great. And it's going to help us in our remote communities. One group, the Wet'suwet'en, had a bit of a internal battle. And they said, you know what? Th that elected council isn't really the only people that speak for us. There's also hereditary council, which is kind of like the difference between the parliament and the queen, where the queen is more of the, the hereditary council. And, and they, they had a battle amongst themselves around who was actually the rightful hereditary council people. And 
those folks said, we, we, we stand against this. And it was a bit of a power grab internally. So that one situation really hung on the relationship between a couple of people on the, on the land there. And those are the folks that actually ended up having the most power in that situation because they held up the entire project that all of those 20 groups had agreed to. So ignoring those folks is not a great strategy. They, they will never come on board. But ignoring them is not the, the way to go. So uh, this is an important example of where power and influence need to separate. So once you find power, it's important to be able to set, uh, persuade them. And this is a great example of from Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power. And I'll read it to you. Self-interest is a lever that will move people. Once you make them see how you can in some way meet their needs or advance their cause, the resistance to your request for help will magically fall away. You must train yourself to think your way inside the other person's mind, to see their needs and interests, to get rid of the screen of your own feelings that obscure the truth. Master this art and there will be no limits to what you can accomplish. Another way to look at it, and if you were gonna print something off from this deck old school and tack it to your cubicle, this would be it. Be of value to the people against you. Once you find them, you need to be valuable to them. And that's what we'll talk about in a second. So the, the, the next step is to really create what we call a human landscape model and identify the people in power. So this is an example from a recent client of ours where we mapped out every individual involved and, and started describing them, get a sense of if you don't have it in one document, you're never gonna be able to get it all organized. So get everybody out there and look for the people that have the power in the moment. And then you need to understand them as humans, as Robert Greene would tell us. So this is a template that I like to use, and it's super helpful uh, when keeping track of the folks um, that, that we want to uh, pay attention to. So in this case, this is not a real person, by the way. This is an amalgamation of lots and lots, so don't, don't think about that. It's just lots of different clients. So this person is powerful. Uh, it's Bob Smith, who's a chief. Um, what does he value? He's business-minded, education is a priority, he's got strong uh, family values and pro hunting rights. His concerns, agriculture is the main economic base for uh, the tribe where he lives. Irrigation is critical to that economy. And he's also really concerned with treaty rights and how they've been abrogated over the, over the years. What motivates Bob is really maintaining that irrigation system, uh, making sure the treaty rights are acknowledged and respected. Uh, stability of the band government, and he is happens to be against the matrilineal devolution of hereditary power, which is something we saw uh, in that uh, coastal gasoline situation. So this gives you a sense of what's going on in his head. Each of these um, motivations, concerns, and values are absolutely legitimate and absolutely are critical to keep in mind as we say, well, how can we add value to Chief Smith? in a way that's gonna allow him to live those values and still let us do what we wanna do. So great way to do next is to look for opportunities to be of service. Remember, we're trying to add value to the people against you. So what can we do? We could address those uh, reservation water security issues that they have, very important concerns. How can we help? We need to support the repair of their irrigation system maybe. We need to hire as many band members in operations wherever possible. Let's make sure that those construction related economic opportunities accrue to the long term and make maximum impact for them. And you know what, maybe this is a great way to do it. Let's just be seen to be supporting tribal rights and traditions. These are ways that, that you can be of service to this particular person, do what you need to do and start changing how that interaction patterns happen with this person in power. You can take it a step further and you say, well, let, let's look at you know, their network of people. So he's influential with these folks. He's influenced by, for example, maybe a band member that runs a construction firm that backs his run for chief. Uh, he's got swing voters up island that are, um, you know, were important to his uh, ascendancy to chief and they have a very specific agenda so that he's influenced by these folks. He's got a network of folks that he's connected to. He's, here's where his area of powers are. You know, some interesting facts. He was a key driver in this particular court case and he's into old cars. Just taking, you know, that maybe is a half hour, hour of research, talking to the folks that know him, 
just taking that time and effort helps you understand this powerful person as a human being so that when you look for ways to add value or you look for ways to make sure someone else adds value, that you really understand what's going to work and be helpful to them because he's got legitimate concerns you need to address them. Next step, you focus on key moments and start building coalitions. So let's say this is uh, Chief uh, Smith and we want to build some coalitions of people that know him and start getting him to the point where he's like, you know what, that project actually isn't as terrible as I thought it was. I still don't like it, uh, but I'm going to hold my nose and let it go for this time. So a great way to do that is to look for these key moments. So one example of a key hypothetical key moment would be, uh, you know, for Keystone XL pipeline, um, that phone call between Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau when Joe got elected, uh, you know, that phone call would have been great if if Justin said, you know what, Joe, I, I know you you got your policy, but we really need this uh, project to move forward. We'd love it if you could help us uh, make this work. What can we do? That key moment is a great inflection point in the conflict. And if you focus on those key moments and work your way back and, and make sure that when those key moments happen, to the extent you can um, uh, predict them, you want them to go your way. So here's a, a template that I use, and I'm going to make this available to you afterwards because uh, it's super helpful. So one is, uh, let's look at the, uh, so when is the date? Like, when is this thing going to happen? Okay, it's going to happen January 2nd or whatever it is. Where is it going to happen? Description of what's happening. Now, what sort of outcomes do we want? We want to be of service to blank, or we want to add value to blank, or we want to mit mitigate the risk of this happening or we wanna make sure to show support to this person. Just being really clear on the outcomes and where we can as, be uh, of service. Who's the powerful people that are gonna be in this meeting and who's gonna be involved? What are their motivations? So what are they trying to accomplish? What are their concerns? As we just talked about with Chief Smith and where can we be of service to everyone involved? And again, sometimes you can't be of direct service but you can facilitate that through people closer to them and that's how you change patterns of interaction. And then you start looking at well, what some ways that we can change perception. So, you know, how can we shake things up the way people think and feel about us? And as we'll talk about, it, it doesn't have to be a home run, just a little nudge in the right direction. And then who are influencers? How can we get to the folks in power? And what's our message to them? Um, what are some other little nudges we can do in the right direction? Let's connect uh, person A with person B. That would be amazing or let's create a new blank, or let's build relationships with this person. Uh, and then what sort of support does the communication um, uh, team need to do, if anything? And then what does the team need from senior leadership in order to make this happen? If you spend an hour or two on each key moment that you know about, this is a great way to organize your thinking and a great way to allocate responsibility to the folks on the team to do it. Again, I'll make that template available to you because you will find it super helpful. Uh, and then last of all, we've got to change organizational habits. So it's important that you be persuasive at the office. You can, and I, I've heard this dozens of times, where folks on the ground will come to a solution, they'll, they'll, they see what's going on, they know what needs to happen, they get back to the office and nobody's listening. It's almost like the folks on the ground get a little bit of PTSD. They're in really tough situations, they get home, no one's paying attention. So it's absolutely critical that you be persuasive at the office. And when you recommend something, someone's gonna like it and someone is not gonna like it. So it's really key to be cognizant of what the, the, the relationships are back at the office. You need to stay agile and resistant. Remember, this is a relationship process over time. It unfolds over time, which means um, things change constantly. And if things change constantly, you need to be agile and resilient to change with it. A great quote uh, from Publius uh, Sirius, Malum Concilium Quod Matari Non Potus. So in other words, the bad, a bad plan, no, bad is the plan that cannot change. So you can have your two-year strategy, you can have your one-month strategy, it doesn't matter because someone looked at somebody funny uh, on, the, on the job site and guess what? Everything's gone to, to heck now. So Bad is the plan that cannot change. You have to stay agile and resilient. And this has organizational impacts. Four ways to look at this. First of all, make sure that your issues management team is a sought after posting. And here's why I say this. 
if it's a sought after posting, that means it's going to be impactful and you're going to get the top people trying to get into it. And that's critical. So you need to embed the C-suite. Every situation I've seen, the issues management team has either the CEO, the president, and you know, uh, chief legal, chief operations, et cetera. So the, the, it's got to have the senior, senior people, because if it doesn't have that air cover within the organization, it's dead in the water. This also makes it really a sought after posting. You mean I get to go in the room and work with the CEO on a project? Sign me up. Manage the board risk register. So speaking of the top, you know, most boards have this risk register where they'll look at every quarter or something like that. Well, when things are changing every hour, you really need to manage their ability to, um, to uh, keep a, an eye on what's going on with the risk. And you can do that in a way that will mobilize those key aspects of what the board can do for you without having the metal in management things. Make sure you're across silos. So it's got to, every department needs to have some sort of representation because if the whole organization is not aligned on what needs to happen, it, nothing's going to work. Uh, bottom up reporting is critical. So you, the people on the, on the ground, the people with literally got their boots on the ground in these situations are worth their weight in gold because they see what's actually going on. And that facilitation of information up and down is critical. Got to meet consistently. Most of these meet every week formally and then uh, every day uh, informally. And then critical, leave your egos at the door. And the, the CEO and the top folks need to model this. I can't be agile uh, and jettison my solution if my performance depends on my consistency. So in other words, people that have, uh, the, the, the say, you know what, the group used my strategy, therefore I deserve a promotion. The group used my strategy, therefore I have more power here. Wrong. The group used my strategy and then new information came in and I was the first one to say, whatever I came up with yesterday, forget it. Everything's changed now. So the ability to leave your ego at the door and, and needs to be modeled at the top level. Otherwise, again, this is dead in the water. Second of all, make sure you include marketing strategies and tactics. And I say this because you know most firms that are really good at building stuff or making amazing things are not necessarily the ones that have marketing as a function because they don't really need to sell at the individual level. That's a shame because as you've seen, conflicts like this happen at the individual level. So we need to use those time-tested persuasion techniques. We need to use uh, psychology and insight research. We need stakeholder for first perspective. This is stuff that comes from marketing and advertising groups. Many times these functions are not part of the kind of organizations that build big projects. That is a huge miss. And so you really need to make sure that you're including those time-tested persuasion strategies. Uh, third of all, as we alluded to, you have to adjust your approach constantly. Every meeting you show up and say, okay, what's changed? What's different? What's new? And then be excited to adjust and pivot. And then last of all, use the seven principles of focal thinking, which are from the book, uh, don't try and control things that can't be controlled. Uh, you cannot control the outcome of a complex system. Don't try. Influence the people with power instead. Don't oversimplify things just to feel comfortable. This is a big one. Oftentimes we will jump into a, a solution that we think makes sense, but we're missing some key information. Always ask yourself, what are we missing? Again, as we talked about, focus on those interactions. Don't worry about the outcomes. You don't control the outcomes. You do control how people interact with each other, and that's where your focus needs to be. Aim for nudges, not home runs. So those small wins that in the moment may not make uh, look like it make a big difference, really important. Reintroduce the right kind of complexity into the system. So things bog down when we oversimplify things that we talked about before. So you got to reintroduce what are we missing? What are the new facts? Get new information. We need uh, the more information, the better. Pay attention to where the actual power lies, as we've talked about, and then prioritize resilience over consistency. So we will adapt, we will adjust. We don't need to be the same. In fact, a bad plan, bad is the plan that cannot change. So strategic leadership in this situation, you've got a better idea now of what to do. You've got a better idea of when to do it. And you've got a much better idea of why you should do it. And if you remember nothing, 
Uh, but one one thing other than my dulcet radio voice is this: be of value to the people against you. That is your focus. If you can be a value to the people against you, you will change those patterns of behavior. You will change how the system works and you will get done what you need to get done. And if you need further proof, it's in a New Yorker comic. If it's in a New Yorker comic, it's gotta be legit. We're being controlled by the random outcomes of a complex system. So I would love to work together with you uh, we should do this. It'd be great. So here's my contact information, uh, mzavo at ansteece.ca. Uh, you can book initial consult with me. Uh, there's my Calendly. It's Mark Zavo slash initial dash consult. Again, this will be in the email that we'll send back to you. Um, and also, uh, you can pick up my book, Fight Different Op, on Amazon if you want to go into more depth about this. But here's some ways that we can work together. Um, let's build and guide the issues management teams. So building that internal capacity is something that we're quite good at, done lots of this. Um, let's get a stakeholder map of who's got power, who's got influence, and start mapping some strategies around that. Uh, obviously, Anstice is well-versed in marketing-based persuasion strategies, and we can apply those to specific conflict situations. And, and again, as we mentioned, it's quite important to do that. Uh, continuously monitor the stakeholder dynamic. So this is another thing of making sure that you've got uh, an eye on what's actually going on with all of the stakeholders and ways that may uh, surprise you. Um, progress reporting to the board and C-suite. So oftentimes um, it, it can help to go to the board or senior senior executives to be able to say, look, here, here's what's going on. Here's the plan. Sometimes it helps to have someone from outside the organization with fresh eyes to be able to do that. Uh, and bring some credibility to what may feel like a little bit of a squishy process to some folks. Uh, help generate internal adoption and change management. Again, we can come up with the greatest plans ever. If nobody at the head office is buying it, then nothing's gonna happen. So that's critical when we look at internal adoption. And then last of all, uh, we'll get you to uh, download that key moment tracker. We'll send it off in an email and you can have that available to you uh, uh, as you see fit. So thank you for your time on this. Uh, just about 35 minutes here, so that's great. Um, if you have any questions, let's do this. Put them in the Q&A. Um, and also, uh, there a, 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 should be a link where you can raise your hand, and we'll try and make sure to um, answer the questions that you may have. So I'm going to stop the share, and we'll um, open it up here to folks. And um, let's see, we're gonna allow everybody to jump in. So if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have um, thoughts, anything you would like more clarification on, now is the time. Okay, I see Jeff, Mr. Sowery, how are you, sir? Not too bad, sir, yourself. Excellent, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. This has been extremely useful. Um, I have a lot of reading ahead of me. <laughs> I, I got a question here, just as I'm going through my notes. What's the risk in trying to leverage an influencer as opposed to the person in power? The, the, the main risk, and that's a great question, the, the main risk is you're just gonna waste time. So you can, and, and we do this all the time. Every, every one of us uh, is guilty of that. You go to the person that's got the squeaky wheel um, and, and you try and make that go away. So uh, like, what's a good example? Let's, let's say there's um, one particularly antagonistic person and you're trying to make sure that that person comes on board. You can spend tons and tons of effort, spin your wheels. Maybe you'll get somewhere with them, maybe you won't. But if they don't have any power to change the actual conflict, then what's the point? So the, the real cost is your opportunity cost of very limited resources. Anything else, Jeff, from your perspective?
Awesome. Okay, we got a, a Q and A here from uh, from Corman. Corman says no questions, but thanks for the presentation. No, sir. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it very much. Any other questions or or thoughts? Any uh, experience that any of you have had that you'd want to share with the group? Oh, Jeff said he can't unmute. Jeff. Try it again there. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so just as a follow up to that one, would it be kind of almost fair to say that influencers to a degree are like trying to change the volume on a stereo system? It's just going to affect the noise in the room. You're not actually going to achieve clarity. Hmm. Can I steal that idea? I love that. Uh, you may indeed, sir. I, and I expect a baseline to go along with it. <laughs> For sure. No, that, that, that makes all the sense in the world. And again, we, we, we always want to focus on the squeaky wheel because we think they're having bigger impact than they actually are. And, and again, if they can't make a change today, then you know they're, they're not worth your time and effort. Not having been said, if, if they've got the ear of someone who does have power, then it can make sense. So if you've got the squeaky wheel who also has the ear of someone who's got a vote or someone who's actually got power, then it can make some sense. So within that context, the, the, the point of focusing on power is not to ignore influencers. The point of focusing on power is just so you have a starting point. Because when you've got everything coming at you, you need some certainty, you need some security, you need to understand where to start. And that's where you start and then you build from there. Uh, Kate's got a question here, I'll read it out. Can you chat a little bit about managing reputation as it pertains to conflict resolution? What should be the short-term versus long-term goal here? Ooh, I like that. Um, so, and, and she follows up, uh, this relates to Jeff's question as well with regard to the squeaky wheel. Yeah, so reputation um, is, is, obviously, uh, is obviously critical. The, the challenge with that is, uh, and this is where reputation versus marketing sometimes can bump up against each other. Reputation is more of a PR corp comm thing. Mark, uh, 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 looking at individuals is more of a marketing thing. It all kind of works together, but they're, they are different. So from a reputation perspective, um, you, you, you need to change the narrative. And what you're doing as uh, using this process is you're changing the narrative with people one person at a time. So what will happen inevitably is you start changing relationships you start adjusting how people think of you. You start having adjusting how people think of each other. You start changing those patterns of interaction. The overall system starts changing. That may or may not show up on a, a reputation tracker or a reputation KPI. Now, remember, we talked about little nudges as opposed to home runs. Home runs will show up on your KPI tracker for, um, for uh, reputation. But they may be too small to show up on, on visual sort of metrics. So that's why metrics are absolutely critical because what you measure is what you're going to get. And if you're measuring little nudges of changing how people feel about you, how they feel about each other, um, that's great. And that's actually how you're going to change the overall system. That might not show up when you're looking at reputation. So I guess the, the short version, or now it's long version, Kate, sorry, uh, is the reputation is macro and we're dealing with micro interactions. As long as the macro measurement is paying attention to that, it's fine. But if all you're looking for are macro measurements, it's gonna be a blunt instrument and won't really help you in the short term. In the long term, as you mentioned, sure, uh, absolutely, that, that can have impact. But a macro would be looking at that whole flock of birds saying, look, it moves over there, great. At the micro level, though, you don't see how that happened. And that's where the uh, the reputation doesn't really help you in the day-to-day -day sort of operations. Hopefully that helps. If there's any follow-up, um, feel free to, to raise your hand or, or fire in some more. Awesome. Okay. Any other questions or, or comments? Any other uh, perspective that uh, that anyone's had that uh, sounds familiar? Is 
there's a stunned silence as you assimilate all of this craziness. Anyway, uh, I think um, I think we will uh, nip it in the bud here so we can hopefully grab a little bit of lunch. Uh, again, um, really love to work with you and either that or at least talk to you about this. Obviously, I love talking about this. Uh, if you like talking about it, you want to learn some more, then feel free to reach out. We'll get back to you with an email, like we said, um, with some links where you can connect and uh, download that key moments tracker, which is going to be super helpful. Anyway, I can be of assistance to you. Uh, it's part of my goal in life. This is how I try to make the world a better place, a little bit at a time. So any way I can be of assistance, any way I can be useful to you, I will jump to the and and gladly do it. So please don't be shy. Anyway, uh, thanks again from the folks at Anstice. Thanks again to Danielle and Rachel for organizing everything. Um, thanks again. Oh, we have one more question. I think we'll let them, if you don't mind, we'll give them this one. Hi, Mark, with an election year, how do you build the momentum while the outcome is unknown? Hmm, interesting. So you can you can look at um, elections kind of like conflicts because uh, there is lots of uncertainty. Things change all the time. There is an element to that. So it, it, there are are definitely some some similarities. I think the the challenge there is identifying the people that have the power to sway uh, public opinion because here the people with power, at least at the moment are the folks that will vote, and that's like everybody. So the challenge with, with applying this directly to elections is that finding the people with power uh, doesn't really help you as much. What you really need to look for are the people who are um, largely persuasive and have the power to persuade at a, at a high sort of level. So that really becomes the big focus of it. And so um, building the momentum in that situation then looks like uh, finding those people that will speak on your behalf, that will that will be the opinion leaders and really keying in on those. And as you calculate who to pay attention to and who to focus your effort on, look at the folks that have the biggest megaphone and really get at them and treat those like the folks that have power and then look for ways to add value to them, look for ways to make sure that they get what they need and then you can move forward uh, towards the election. Hopefully that that helps. Not a direct correlation, but anytime you're trying to do something with large groups of people, similar sort of uh, um, uh, steps can apply. Okay, uh, I think uh, that pretty much it for, for folks. And again, thanks again. Uh, please let me do anything I can help out. And uh, as always, next time, Hopefully, if you're in Calgary, we'll be able to do this in real life. And I look forward to seeing all of you folks there. Thanks again for your time and I'll end this here. Take care.